Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about a joint that's unique to the cervical spine, and that's what's called the oncovertebral joint. All right, so first, before we go into this, let's do a little bit of anatomy here. Let's identify some of these vertebrae and maybe some associated structures. So right here, we're looking at an anterior view. We can tell that because of the mandible. This bone up here, this is C1 or the atlas. This is the first cervical vertebra. Below that, we have C2, the axis. And then below that, we have C3. Notice the floating bone, the hyoid, actually is usually situated between C2 and C3. But it's anterior to those. Below that, we have C4, C5, C6, C7. And then here's T1. And again, we can tell this is T1 because here's the first rib that's actually attaching um, on that facet on T1. You can actually see the first rib right here. And then this one would be T2. Now at this point in the playlist, we've talked about the facet joints, also called zygopophyseal joints. We've talked about the intervertebral joints. The oncovertebral joint is probably new to most people. Uh, the oncovertebral joint is a result of the formation of something called an uncus, or an unconate process, as it's often termed, on cervical vertebra C3 through C7. Okay, So here's an anterior view of some of the cervical vertebrae. Uh, we could say this top one maybe is C3. If you look at the vertebral body, um, on the superior aspect, on either side of it, you see this superior projection going upward. Okay. This is the unconate process. Uh, if this is an anterior view, this would be the right unconate process. This would be the left unconate process over here. So there's one on each side. Okay. Um, and if we look now at the vertebra below, it also has unconate processes. Here's the right unconate process or right uncus. Here's the left uncus. And this unconate process is going to form a joint uh, with the vertebra above. Okay, and this joint right here between the unconate process of the vertebra below and the inferior portion of the vertebra above, this is called the uncovertebral joint. So because there's an uncus on either side, there's an uncovertebral joint on either side. Okay, uh, so the uncovertebral joints are really 10 saddle-shaped diarthroidal articulations. What the heck does that mean? Well, uh, they're saddle-shaped. There's 10 because there's two of these at each level left and right. There are also diarthroses. Um, diarthrosis, if you remember, means synovial joint. Some sources are going to be hesitant to call these synovial joints, but as we'll see on the next slide, they actually share some similarities with uh, synovial joints in the sense that they actually um, have chondrocytes present and synoviocytes. Now we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, also know that the uncovertebral joints are also sometimes termed the joints of Lushka, after someone who discovered them, I suppose. So again, the uncovertebral joint, it's an articulation between the unconate process of the inferior vertebra, so this is the unconate process of the inferior vertebra, and the beveled infralateral aspect of the superior vertebra. So you can see that right here. It's beveled, it's infralateral in terms of that superior vertebra. And so that's your uncovertebral joint. The uncovertebral joint is going to develop from loading of the head in the first 12 years of life. Okay? So you're not born with an unconate process. Okay? These actually develop as a result of loading. Well, if you think about it, the head sits on top of the cervical spine. So the cervical spine therefore bears weight of everything above it, including the head. And so by loading, that actually triggers the formation of these unconate processes and they project upward. Um, as we'll see in the timeline video, which is the next video for the development, we'll see that around eight years old, we actually really see these unconate process. At 12, it's going to start the formation of clefting, and then ultimately the uncovertebral joints will be fully formed around 33 years of age. Now again, what levels are we going to see these uncovertebral joints? We're going to see them at the C2, C3 level down to the C6, C7 level. Why is that? It's because the unconate processes exist on C3 down to C7. So if we look at C3 right here in this picture, um, it has unconate processes projecting upward. Well, they're going to articulate with the inferior or infralateral surface of C2. 
So therefore, there's going to be a C2, C3 oncovertebral joint. C7 is the lowest of the cervical vertebrae. And it's also the lowest vertebra that has an uncanate process. So it's going to, they're going to project upward and interact with the infralateral surface of C6. So that means the lowest uncovertebral joint is going to be at the C6, C7 level. And so we have two at this level, two here, two there, two there, and two there. Five levels, two each, left and right. That gives us our 10 UV joints. Um, the UV joint, uncovertebral joint, um, does have a synovial compartment. Some sources are hesitant to call them synovial joints uh, because they seem to lack some features of a synovial joint, but they do have a synovial compartment, and this compartment creates the posterior lateral border of the intervertebral disc. Okay, so if you look right here, it can be a little bit difficult to get some perspective, but again, you're looking at the anterior surface of the disc right? Because this is the vertebral body that's anterior. So this is your disc. Well, these green things right here, these are the UV joints. And so you can see, therefore, that the UV joint really is on the posterior lateral border of that intervertebral disc, okay? Now, what are the functions of the UV joint? You wouldn't just have this for no reason at all. What does it do? Well, it has four major functions here, and then a fifth one that we're going to talk about extensively in the timeline video uh, that's very unique to this type of joint. So these four functions. Number one, the UV joint guides and limits cervical flexion and extension. Okay, you want to have a lot of mobility in the cervical spine, but too much of anything can be bad because... Uh, particularly in flexion, if you go too far, then you will actually put tension on the spinal cord and your entire nervous system. So again, you want these movements to be limited. Number two, it reduces side bending of the cervical spine, so lateral flexion. So basically, if you imagine taking your ear and putting it to your shoulder, okay, that is a side bending. Um, the reason why you want to limit that is also to protect the spinal nerve roots. If you imagine laterally flexing or side bending your neck to the right, so take your right ear, bend it down to touch your sholdder, um, the right intervertebral foramen is going to narrow. What goes through the intervertebral foramen? Spinal nerve roots. And so if you laterally flex to the right too much, you'll compress the right intervertebral foramen too much, and you might compress the right spinal nerve root at that level. Same thing goes of laterally flexing to the left too much. If you do too much to the left, you'll compress, or narrow I should say, that left intervertebral foramen, and you will potentially compress the left spinal nerve root at that level. Okay. What else does it do? Number three, it prevents posterior translation of neighboring vertebrae. Um, there's a little translation allowed, uh, but excess is, of course, bad, so we want to prevent that posterior translation in excess. So, for example, uh, the C4-5 right here, uncovertebral joint, would actually prevent posterior translation of C4 relative to C5. Okay? And then the last function here, it reinforces the posterior lateral aspect of the intervertebral disc. Uh, we mentioned that bullet point up here, but again, if you look here at the disc, uh, these green things on either side are the UV joints, and so they make up that posterior lateral part of the disc. And so being there on either side, it'll actually help to mitigate some of the effects of disc herniations in the cervical spine. Before we go to the next slide, uh, remember that I said that the uncovertebral joint is a diarthrodial articulation. It's diarthrosis, um, and that means synovial joint. Um, most sources will be hesitant to call this a synovial joint because by definition, a synovial joint that's truly a synovial joint ought to have all the features of a synovial joint. The UV joint does not seem to have everything, but it shares a lot of common features. Um, first of all, it contains synovia sites. These are, these are cells that actually make up the synovial membrane and can secrete synovial fluid. Um, and it also has chondrocytes for the production of cartilage. And those are things that all synovial joints have. Um, so it has some features of it. And so we might actually term it a synovial joint, um, but we need to be careful with that. The other thing is it, is it has nerve fibers, both from the somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. And so that being said, um, it can also be a pain generator for the cervical spine. Uh, we also mentioned that the facet joints and the disc itself can be a pain generator. Well, now the UV joint can as well. Now, what happens if somebody has dysfunction of the uncovertebral joint? Well, if someone has dysfunction here, the symptoms are going to be, uh, first of all, very little pain. 
Um, most people who have UV joint symptoms do not have much pain. Might have a little bit and it's more vague, hard to localize, more of a discomfort than a pain. The hallmark of UV joint dysfunction is actually stiffness. Uh, that stiffness is going to far outweigh in severity relative to the pain. And also that stiffness is going to be present more in the morning. It's going to be morning stiffness. And as you go throughout the day, motion is lotion, you get the synovial fluid moving, the stiffness tends to go away a little bit. Okay, But the stiffness is worse in the morning, and the stiffness is absolutely worse than the pain. Generally, in most people, there's no referred or neurological symptoms. Okay, In order to have neurological symptoms, you have to have um, a nerve root to compress. And generally speaking, the UV joint does not compress the nerve root, so for most people there's going to be no neurological symptoms. However, it is worth mentioning that we can actually, as we age, have thinning of the disc between these two vertebrae. And we'll talk about this uh, in the next video when we look at the timeline. But as we get into our 50s and 60s especially, this disc starts to thin. And that's going to bring these corresponding vertebrae closer together. When they get closer together, the uncovertebral joints are going to get closer together. And it results usually in the formation of osteophytes. These are little bony growths that can project into different areas. Well, if you think about this, um, the UV joint is very close to the intervertebral foramen which is more on the posterior side. So if you have osteophyte growth on the UV joint, you can have those osteophytes poke into the intervertebral foramen, and then that can compress a nerve root. So generally, you're not going to have neurological symptoms, especially in younger people uh, who have this type of dysfunction. However, if the person is older, especially 50 years old and on, and they do have osteophyte formation, those osteophytes can project uh, into the intervertebral foramen and potentially compress a nerve root. Alternatively, those osteophytes can also project into the vertebral canal and maybe put some little pressure on the spinal cord, which can also lead to neurological symptoms. Okay? And some signs of things that you could reproduce or things that you would observe the patient having. Uh, first of all, they're going to have loss of extension and rotation. Uh, the neck is going to tend to be in a forward flexed position. And they're going to have loss of lateral flexion, limited side bending in all positions of the neck. You can side bend when your head's in neutral or when your neck's in flexion or extension. So side bending is going to be limited in all those positions. And then there may also be crepitus and grinding as you go through movements of the neck. Okay, so hopefully this video gave you a good overview of the uncovertebral joint structure and some important facts about their functions and what dysfunction of it kind of looks like. In the next video, we're actually going to look at a timeline of UV joint development. And we're actually going to see that the UV joint development leads to fissuring of the cervical discs, which is actually not pathological. It's actually a normal thing that happens. And it leads to some cool biological effects that we only see in the cervical spine. So make sure to join us then. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.